regardless of this this opinion, Mifepristone remains extraordinarily safe. We have decades of data to suggest it is a very, very safe medication and is essential health care for people who need abortion care, as well as other health care like miscarriage management. And so this ruling, which is filled with biased and very politically motivated language, is incredibly upsetting. The Biden administration has already appealed the decision by a Trump-appointed Texas judge to revoke the FDA approval of a key abortion pill. Former Vice President Mike Pence praised the ruling in an official statement. But here's the thing. Most Republicans have remained very silent on the issue. I want to know why. Back with me tonight, Democratic Congresswoman Katie Porter of California, who has announced she will be running for Senate next year. She is also the author of the new book, I Swear, Politics is messier than my minivan. It is out today. It is so great to have you here in person. I do want to start talking, or I start our conversation talking about abortion. For decades, Republicans have been fighting to limit or ban abortion. They are getting closer to what they wanted. Does it not surprise you that, with the exception of Mike Pence, they're not saying much? I think that they're near their end game. Um, and so I think they're waiting and watching to see just how far the American people will let them go. This is not a, a last minute strategy for them. This is the end result of 30 and 40 years of plotting. And so I think it's part of their strategy right now to be quiet and to hope that Democrats and Americans in general who want Americans to be able to make their own decisions about health care um, try to stay silent, too. So I, I think ultimately the Republicans are going to learn a painful lesson here. And the tragic part is that a lot of people will have their health care options limited along the way. Oof. New topic. You are running, I mentioned it, next year for Dianne Feinstein's Senate seat. There is some criticism. She has been out sick. She has been home for over, she was hospitalized. She's been home for over a month. Her office says she's working from home. But according to the San Francisco Chronicle, it's a problem for the Judiciary Committee because she's not there to vote. They can't put forward judges. And that's really important. Given that, do you think she should step down? Well, I think the solution on the judge's portion is to have her removed from her committee if she's not able to, to do her service. And I think that's something that she can talk about with Majority Leader um, Chuck Schumer. I think they'll chart a path together. Um, but of course, I, I wish Senator Feinstein well. I'm, she I reportedly has shingles, which is incredibly painful. Horrible. Um, and so I wish her well on her recovery. But you know, I think one of the things I talk about a little bit in my book is that Congress people are also people. And they get sick. And they... They have kids who need them, and they have other problems. And I think if we want to have a representative government of real people, we're going to have them have some real people problems. So let's talk about this book, OK? There's a lot of amazing things in it. One thing that stood out to me, you talk about, I'm going to call it your, your, your signature accessory, your whiteboard. You are famous for this whiteboard. You've gone viral. You've gone, uh, everybody knows about it. You have grilled people. You have schooled people. When you pull out the whiteboard, how does it make a difference? We think it helps everybody who's listening, including the witness, kind of stay on point and follow along. And so I think the goal of the whiteboard is to make it hard for the witness to worm away. I use it for the same reason I used to use it in the classroom. I used to ask, I used to be a teacher and a professor, and I would ask a really important long question. And I'd get to the end, and the student would say, um, can you repeat the question? And so I think we're dealing with Americans who are trying to get dinner on the table. They're trying to get to work. They're trying to, you know, pay their bills. And they only have a couple minutes to check in on politics. And I want them to be able to see that Washington's actually asking the right questions and getting the, the answers that we deserve. And so the whiteboard's just a tool to do that. It's like any other prop or any other teaching tool. It's really about trying to be more effective. Is it frustrating for you, though, because that's when you have these moments when America watches and they're saying, aha, I want this change. I want these businesses to operate differently. But when those hearings are over, we don't see much change. Those CEOs go back home on their private planes and they keep on trucking. Well, I think it depends. I mean, look, we have a different CEO at Wells Fargo after I questioned him. Um, mm -hmm. When I questioned the CDC director about making COVID testing free, do you know what I got him to promise? That COVID testing would be free. And personally, that's been a big benefit, I think, for all of us as we tried to survive the pandemic. So there are certainly CEOs. Um, there are certainly witnesses who I've asked tough questions, and they, they kind of went back to business as usual. But I'm not done. That's part of the reason I'm running for the Senate. I will be able to serve on twice as many committees, and that means twice as much whiteboard fun. You also get very practical in the book. And you write about how people and that they should 
write to their congressperson, contact their congressperson. How and why should they do that? Sort of an old-fashioned idea. My mom used to do it in the 80s when I would travel. My daughter's going to be out of the country. Please look out for her, Stephanie Rule. Why should people do it now? They just, they like to just tweet their views and hope a congressperson catches it. Well, we actually keep track of what people are saying to us. So I think people often think that the important work we do is kind of in Washington, and the less important work is when we're in our homes, when we're in our districts. And so it's not true. The most important work I do is in California, learning from Californians, listening to them, seeing problems firsthand, getting ideas for solutions. And so people who call, who share their opinion, who ask for help, um, they're really teaching me what I need to know to do my job well. And so it's an important responsibility. It goes back and forth. Sometimes I teach them, this is what this really means. This is what the deficit means. This is what the debt ceiling means. Um, and at the same time, they teach me. And so I, I think fundamentally, if you're doing Congress right, it's a learning and teaching job. One of the reasons that minivan of yours is so messy is because you do have a job in California and in Washington, and you have three children that you are raising on your own. You're a single mom. You get really personal in the book, and you talk about how you almost didn't run because logistically you couldn't figure it out. And now it's not just something Congress people face. Women, mothers face it. They, they, they have <laughs> huge career aspirations, but the world isn't designed for professional success and personal success. Can you speak to this? Well, it's really important that it, we change that. Um, and it's important as a matter, by the way, of global competition. The United States is falling behind because we're not making it possible for our most talented people to stay in the workforce and succeed at the highest levels. We're not going to have the best and the brightest if we don't make it possible for that to include parents and women and people who have family responsibilities. And so I think at the broad macro level, it's really, really important to see this as part of our overall economic strategy. Now, when you're sitting there and you're late and you're on the phone and your dinner's burning and you're trying to remember what you were supposed to be doing and a kid's screaming. And there's a kid you forgot to pick up 20 minutes ago. Definitely. I feel that. It's, it's, I call mine lightly supervised. They're not unsupervised. They're lightly supervised. But, but I think what it's... made you decide, you know what, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to run. I'm going to make this work. Well, I think that, listen, ultimately, I think I did what most Americans do every day as working parents. You just keep going. And it's you just say to yourself, can I do five more minutes? Can I do one more hour? Can I do one more show, right? Can I do one more late night? And the answer is you just keep trying. But look, we're not going to get government that's more responsive to the needs of parents if we don't elect some parents. When I got to Congress and I, I said... We don't have a schedule. Where is the schedule? What is the plan? When, when do we go home? I have to make childcare arrangements. They said, oh, Katie, you know, your situation is just so unique. I was like, unique? There's 10 million single parents. They never created it because, the, because it was designed for a person to have a career. And that person had another person at home, right. their wife, who ran their house. Yep. And that's just not a modern life. Yeah, and I talk about this sort of sinking feeling about thinking to myself, who could do this? Who could make this work? And then I have this sinking feeling that the answer is men. Men can, right? And it's really, really important that, that we have a government that looks like us, that we have a government that goes through the same experience as we do. Um, I think we're seeing that right now with abortion, for example. It is helpful to have people who have chosen to be parents, have chosen to have to go to get reproductive health care to be in this debate. Um, and so it matters. You matter. It's always good to see Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Congratulations on your book. Congresswoman Katie Porter.